Hi, uh, my name is Meg Doherty. Thank you for having me today. I'm so happy to be following up with um, with you all after you all to talk about maximizing the impact of user feedback. And I made this presentation about effective practices for community management, but think about this can apply to any of the work that, that you all are doing. Yeah. Oh, closer. Yeah, that's good. Okay. Um, so starting with the problem statement, um, my, my statement here is that community managers and community management activities are already built in pathways for maximizing user feedback. Um, so oftentimes when I'm talking to um, open source projects, they have um, GitHub repositories where they're doing a lot of communication anyway and a lot of community management. So I'm not here to say you need a whole new workflow or new things to do, um, but how can we leverage your existing pathways to add some more rigor to the work that you're already doing when it comes to uh, managing user feedback. So just what we'll go over today, um, some strategies for gathering user feedback, techniques for synthesizing user feedback, and then methods for following up on user feedback, um, as we call closing the loop. And then would love to open up the discussion and hear what, what's working in, in the projects that you all are working on. Uh, quick about me, I'm Meg. Um, my day job, I'm the Deputy Chief User Experience Officer at the All of Us Research Program at the National Institutes of Health. Um, as of last week, we are the largest, most diverse uh, genomic data set in the world. Um, and we have a lot of researchers who, in very similar ways, are uh, very new to the cloud and are not used to um, working in, in these um, remote environments. Um, I'm also an SSI fellow, where my focus is on uh, promoting usability practices in, in research software projects. And um, like many others, I'm an open life science mentor. So there's a technical name for the absence of user research called guessing. So just to set the scene here, I know I, in many conversations, like we don't have time, I'm the, I'm the user, I, I can figure it out. Um, but really just building in this idea of it really is guessing. Um, and, and, and while that might be the, the best thing that you can do in the moment, um, I'm going to show you a couple of things that you can add on to your, to your workflow. So some strategies for gathering user feedback. I often, uh, myself and other designers, people come and show us their website and say, can you UX this? And, and the first question I'm always going to say is, what is the goal? Like, what, what are you trying to do? Because I can't help you improve your user experience. I don't know what you're trying to help your users do. So kind of two frameworks, um, and, and these are on the slides, they're all linked. I hope you can use them and follow up with them as, as tools. But on the left-hand side here is um, from uh, Eric Hall's Just Enough Research, and it really does talk about what are these lean processes that we can build. And it really depends on what questions you're really asking about. So oftentimes I hear about questions about users. I want to know who my users are. I want to know what they're interested in. It's also important to know, um, you know, wh wh uh, what are you are your users used to doing, um, because you want to replicate that in your existing workflows. And then, if you're looking from more of a business perspective, if you have questions about the organization and the competition, um, there are things like brand audits and SWOT analysis, and all of these terms here um, have an associated body of knowledge and, and body of templates that you can that you can use starting today in your own work. So th this is sort of your menu of choices of, of user feedback and uh, with Q&A I'm happy to dive into what, what, what these all mean and the benefits of, of some of them. And then the, the funnel, I like to show this funnel because depending on where you are in your research process, it will dictate the best methods to choose. Um, and in and, and, and some of my SSI conversations so far, surveys tend to be a very popular tool that I have found among um, open source projects. But it, it really depends on where you are in the process. You may not even know what problem you're solving for people, or maybe you already have a solution in mind and you may be trying to retrofit to a problem. We call that a solution in search of a problem. Um, those are my least favorite projects. <laughs> uh, but, but really like figuring out what problems are you trying to solve for your users first? And then once you've identified that problem, are we solving it the right way? And if it's yes, we're solving it the right way, how well are we solving it? And then when you get into more of the formative and summative work, it's really about um, the, uh, the, the introduction of a feature or the introduction of a product and how it's going. So this is where you can think about um, analytics for your tools and you can track usage and understand are people using the things that we built in the way that we were expecting them. 
So those are a few um, feedback methods, depending on your question. Um, relative to this group, I wanted to pause here. So at the Office Research Program, we um, launched access to our data three years ago, um, as of the, uh, last month. And we have um, a growing number of publications. And so the team and I, as we think about talking to users and understanding feedback about their experiences using our data and our tools and our support materials, we started to realize that the limitations section in the publications is actually a great source of feedback. So if you're in the project that has um, scientific outputs and papers, you can really learn a lot about your user experience in this way. So we're just at the beginning, but you can see here, even just from this one paragraph, um, we see challenges with data missingness. We see challenges um, with our longitudinal data. We have a lot of snap data snapshots in our in our data set. And then here, here, um, the findings from all of us also may not be generalizable to the U.S. population. This is a bit. This is a big question for us because, as a UX team, that tells us, well, maybe we're not explaining it enough, or maybe we could build a support article. So lack of clarity around generalizability. So we work very closely with our scientific teams to co-create the content that our researchers can use to better understand um, th things like generalizability in our data set. So these few things, um, you know, on the surface, th they're not immediately features. They're not something that you have to go code in software or you have to go get a developer to work on. Some of them are documentation. Some of them may be um, for strategic input. So when um, I'm part of the uh, leadership team on the All of Us Research Program, I can bring this data and say, you know, people are really worried about data missingness um, and, and, and really push, push for um, strategic plans more than features. So gathering user feedback is not just for changing your features and changing your product. It's also for changing the, shaping the direction of your product, allowing user feedback to influence um, where you're headed and not being, um, you know, often we can be fixed to what we what we want the solution to be or what uh, we think the solution might be. But leaving room for, um, leaving room for users would be great. I'm going through the chat. I'm just going to pause and see if there's questions. Uh, no, okay, I don't see any questions. Good. Um, okay, so publications as, a, as another great source of feedback. And so then, um, now that you've collected your feedback, a few techniques uh, for synthesizing user feedback. I am not a behavioral scientist, but we do use behavioral science in a lot of our work. So this is Matt Wallert's um, intervention design process, because oftentimes when you're designing a feature or a workflow, you're really wanting a user to do something in a prescribed way or a suggested way. So we go through this design process an example of, 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 of where we've done this uh, more recently is we deal with sensitive health data. So we have a lot of training around responsible conduct of research. So it's very important that researchers are asking questions that um, limit the potential for stigmatizing research. So we asked ourselves, like, what are the promoting and the inhibiting pressures to limiting stigmatizing research? And you can map those pressures. So once, once you identify the the, the the pieces that influence behavior in question, you can see maybe there are things that really, you know, elevate people to do a certain thing, but maybe there are also detractors, like my funder wants me to move quickly, or I don't have enough time to, to think about stigmatizing research, or I don't have the training, whereas, you know, promoting pressures might be, um, I'll be rewarded in some way, or I will avoid penalty. So mapping out those pressures will really help you vi visualize the behavior you're trying to build within your workflow. And I believe this, I know this is like a grand tour of everything, so happy to go back um, and dive in a little bit deeper, but um, mapping the pressure is one of, one of my favorite activities. And if you spend time um, around user experience, um, you may have be familiar with personas and user journeys, but the best way to create themes from your user feedback is to personify them in these archetype categories. So um, any project can have a set of personas who you're building for. You might say also known as like an audience. Um, so you may have like, we have the, the data curator and then we have the data administrator and then we have the, um, the epidemiologist all working on the same team. So you can create these sort of composite um, visuals to, to help your team communicate who are the people we're building for 
And then what are their strengths and weaknesses and what do they need from the products that we're building? They're not meant to rep represent an individual, but a, 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 a composite of individuals. And then a customer journey map is also another way to visualize the findings that you have. So you can see here, this kind of line kind of like goes up and down. It's an emotional roller coaster. So if you have an experience, if you're onboarding new users, um, sometimes we have a lot of challenges with our data access process and identity verification is two big things that are painful at the moment. Um, so if this were my user journey, it would kind of dip down really low to, to really build empathy and awareness for your teammates, engineers, again, executives on your program and your project to really understand like where should we be investing next? Um, because um, nothing's, you're gonna get no better um, investment than working on those pain points. And another, um, another point of a customer journey map is not viewed here, but sometimes we put a threshold line. Like at what point is the experience so bad that I will abandon it? You know, we have, because you know, we, we are uh, proud to be a large genetic diverse genomic data set Sometimes they're just thinking of, oh, the data is so good, they'll stay. They'll 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 deal with any bad experience. Um, but as a as a user experience professional, I have to disagree um, because there there is a point of abandonment. There's a point where you know there's not enough minutes in the day for you to you know hack something together. So people will move on. You want to know what that what that break point is for people and abandonment um, for folks. And um, another one, if you're um, in uh, product management uh, prioritization is also very big. So, um, you know, we, we try to move uh, from I insights into action very quickly. Uh, we're, we're not doing um, safe, but we do some version of, of agile. But when you have a finding, you know, one person may tell you something that may give you a hint of, okay, this might be a problem. Now, if five people tell you the same thing, now you've got a real substantive um, piece of work in front of you. So we try to think about um, the reach like h how how big is this problem? So take the example of identity verification. Everybody needs to log in. So the reach is 100%. 100% of people need to go through this process. But you know, if you have a sub page of a of a tutorial that's not really working, less so. But maybe it's important for a priority subset of your users. And then you can think about impact. So um, back to that customer journey. Like, what are going to be the biggest bets for you? Um, to, to build customer satisfaction or your user satisfaction. And then confidence, um, because a lot of this is qualitative in nature, um, we have to make some judgment calls about how confident we are that this is a problem and it's worth solving. So having some rubric in your mind of, of how confident you are could be on, we, you know, scale of one, uh, zero to 100. Um, you can make up your own scale. And then this is where um, development um, engineering and, and our content developers come in because we, we often don't know the effort. We don't know how, how much something will take. So reach times impact times confident divided by effort gives you some raw number for you to have your own list of priorities that you wanna do, sort, start at the top, and that's your prioritization. So synthesizing feedback doesn't just end with, here's my findings. It really ends with now what, and in now what next? Um, and you'll, you know, often do this, like I said, in partnership with um, product engineering and, and project leadership. So then methods for following up on user feedback. Um, this may not be too too surprising for you all, and you probably have seen this before, um, but the CSCCE, um, community participation model, starts with sort of this like a hub and spoke model of community management all the way through co-creation. So um, one of the key metrics that we use on our, um, our support hub where we have our, our community forum where people can post and, and speak with each other is the number of user generated content and then the number of um, replies by another user. So real maturity in, in, in having community participation is when people are answering questions for each other. Um, and, and then we, we, we more are the, uh, the gardeners of the garden and people can actually start to answer their own questions. Um, that's sort of like the height of, of um, participation. This applies to all community, but I, I do believe there's an intersection with user experience of how can, how can we take user experience insights like, um, you know, I 
I need a, an example of a, a workflow that I can't figure out myself and allow the community to build it themselves. But you need to build pathways for them to contribute, which is a, another talk <laughs> that I've, I've given before. Um, and the other is um, kind of a, a parallel, but it's a ladder of participation. Um, we talk about co-design, co co-production a lot, but it's really important to see like where we start um, from educating to co-production because we're often in this like this zone of doing things to or for people without involving them. This goes back to the slide one of, of th this is sort of this like command and control, like we know best, don't worry, we'll, we'll do it for you mentality. And my message here is like, if, if we can just start to move up the ladder, not only is it good for our end product, but it also um, alleviates a lot of the, the work ourselves. So we can share the work, we can share the, the feedback that comes from, from the co-production. Co um, but like I said, there's, um, none of this happens. If you're familiar with open, um, open leaders training with the Mozilla Foundation, it's, um, we talk about open, open source by design, not uh, open source by design, not by default. It just doesn't automatically happen. These are teams and um, I've got a team of 30 people who work on this stuff. It's not a, it's not, it's not a small task. So um, if you're also looking for ways to um, get a UX designer on your project, I'm happy to help you build a business case. Um, and I'm always looking to um, meet other UX designers in scientific software. Um, so please, um, this is the beginning of a conversation, uh, one of many. Um, so that's the end of my um, kind of slides, but I thought um, in a little bit of time we have left, definitely open up to questions, but more discussion of, of like, what other strategies, techniques, and methods do you all use that I haven't mentioned? I'd be very curious. Um, and then um, what are the opportunities that exist at the intersection of user experience and community management? Um, There's just like a very interesting nugget I have found where user some programs that have user experience don't have community management because they don't see the value. And the inverse is true. Like some places who have community managers don't invest in user experience. But I do have a theory that they're sort of more <laughs> similar than we think. Um, so curious um, what people think uh, some opportunities are. And then, yeah, any other curiosities you have, I'm happy to, to take questions and um, any feedback on the slides as well. This is the first time I'm doing something like this, so thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you, I think, for the talk. Uh, it was really interesting. One of the slides resonated with me on the feedback methods depends on your question. Uh, and then you showed us uh, publications as a source of feedback. And I have found that, uh, especially in research uh, project, uh, it's very hard to get a feedback because uh, most of the uh, articles or uh, Lean UX websites or any other guidelines I can find online mentions, yeah, get a, your feedback, create some metrics, act on them, try experiment, but uh, most of them just applies to websites where it is easy to integrate analytics, track users, what they are doing, uh, and uh, basically you have a map showing uh, different levels of feedback, and almost half of them doesn't apply to research uh, because it's not simply available. Uh, only, so for example, we have started doing uh, personas, experiments, uh, some interviews to a degree, uh, but it feels like we are missing most of the feedback and that's why we end up with very primitive UIs or primitive user experiences and as, as you said, most of the time people just stick because they, they need the data, they want to work with <laughs> the data itself so they, and they don't know whether they have any other choice. So do, do you have other examples of uh, getting feedback uh, in some other way? Uh, or we, yeah, just, just those, those are... are uh, um, I'd love to, to, to think more deeply about it, but right off the bat, I think um, most of most of the work can be done um, on paper. So um, we, we draw sketches and we draw workflows. I think even getting feedback on early designs could be very helpful. Um, we also, let me go to like, um, like this user journey part here. We, um, you know, we interview a lot of people and say, okay, we think this is how a workflow happens. We think this is how people use it. But getting feedback even on these artifacts is another way to get feedback so that you're not, you're not always, I totally hear that like the 
testing and analytics is not always possible on, on, on that on, on, on your context. But you can certainly get feedback on these more static images, um, and, and those those do go a long way because you're doing these up front, and it will help you know pieces that you're putting together. Yeah, but I'm happy to kind of know more about uh, yeah additional limitations that you might have. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, you. If no one else has any question, but I have one more. Uh, so this publications as a source of feedback uh, that that just tells me that something it's. Uh, Maybe you could run, or maybe you have done all the, already. You could run some uh, machine learning algorithm on a set of the articles to see uh, to in inspect the limitations part to see. Okay, this is working with this data set. This is the feedback that's associated with it, uh, and just maybe do a rank of something like that. Have you ever explored this? Uh? Yeah, that that's exactly what we're doing now. Yeah, I'm, I'm smiling because I can't wait for this project to happen so I can actually talk about it. Um, but that's the idea. Yeah, so that we can actually see, um, even within different domains, you know, we're a disease agnostic database. So it's it's come every, <laughs> come science. If you're in health science, I think you can like us, but clearly like we're genomics mostly data set. So be very curious to see who has different experiences. And, and I will say too, um, I kind of knock surveys a little bit because I think that sometimes they're overused, but um, we also do satisfaction surveys. So after a certain period of use, you can also implement, you know, a five question survey and have some pretext. And that's where we're getting a lot of open ended feedback as well. So um, if you're looking for feedback on a specific task, if you're looking for feedback on, you know, overall experience, that's another opportunity that um, doesn't require too much development or intervention in the software. Okay, that's great. Thanks. Uh, and I just want to say that you are absolutely right saying that we need community managers to the, to to manage the uh, UX part of it because developers simply are very terrible at <laughs> what we do in right. terms it, of user experience. It, yes. I can it, say it, that as a developer for it, myself. <laughs> well, I've learned a lot because, uh, yeah, SSI, when I presented this, someone said, I, I have to do another thing. You're adding another thing to my long list of responsibilities. So, no, we're here to help. Yeah, in the back. Hi, thank you for your interesting talk. Um, I have more of a community management type of question. Yes, please. Um, so I, in my experience, it's easy to get feedback from the usual suspects, mm -hmm. but it can be difficult to get feedback from the people that you actually want to be reaching, but that aren't yet really a part of your community. And I'm just wondering if you personally have any experience sort of trying to expand your community in that way and if you have any good strategies around that. Yeah, for sure. So we, um, when we think about personas or our audiences, we separate the researchers from prospective researchers to existing researchers, just to keep ourselves honest of who are we listening to. So uh, late last year, we put out, it's more of a marketing survey, but a usage and attitudes is a type of survey to get an understanding of people who are not here yet, what might make them switch. So um, we have a, a, a few data sets in the US that we know we're, you know, on par with. Um, so we would, you know, we, we went to those communities to say, hey, um, you don't, if you're not an all of us researcher yet, would you be interested in speaking with us? So finding the, the places where you think that they might be compared to other projects, um, that's where we find a lot of our, um, a lot of our feedback. We also have, um, yeah, we have an engagement team, a researcher engagement team. So they do a lot of grassroots on the university level, just going into different settings and talking about the promise of all of us. So we get a lot of anecdotal feedback from there as well. And those are, those are also prospective researchers. But it's also checking your biases too, right? Because, you know, they're, you're right in front of them. They're not going to say, I don't like this thing. Or, um, yeah, they may be less honest. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Hi, thank you for putting all these things together and it, it's make me reflecting about using this practice not just for software but also for any open development, right? Like we have several community projects and are we like we really need to move people up that ladder, like you said, from preaching and moving up to a proper engagement. Yeah. And I think we often find that people get stuck because of the middle part, because that's the one in these effort where you need a lot of handholding and consulting to get people to to figure things out on their own. And 
something we have been trying to do is to move our training from being not just like telling people things but also engaging with what they are doing so we have we have for instance bring your own data events now that's not going to work for you you will have to do bring your own code event instead right, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but the thing is to make it a bit more interactive and i think that's also a good way to to gather user feedback as well to bake in some small exercises not massive one that will kill the whole joy of the event but some small feedback sessions there because you have potential users and existing users there in the room at different levels and then you can i think you can also start building this personal relationship so you can lift up but for us the problem with the consulting is that we don't have the effort right we don't have the effort to get people to spend you know one week with someone else's project and so on so yeah hackathons kind of work sometimes but they can be quite coding ways but i think the hackathon spirit can be used in other ways as well yeah no thank you for that i i think one one um one response to that is we we recently have put out um, I'm not sure if it's public yet um, a scientific framework where our chief medical officer is, is really setting the scientific research agenda as a way to call for participation to say you know um, you know diabetes is an important category so really have, having an agenda can help mobilize people to direct projects um, otherwise yeah those sort of calls they can feel a little um, vague or people people might not see themselves in the call specifically yeah thank you um, i think we're at time so i just keep monitoring that we're over time um but thank you all so much yeah <laughs>